Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. I didn't mention with Alyssa, she's studying education as well, early childhood and on up. So we are in John chapter 6 tonight. Very briefly, as we're going to give more time to the actual communion, we want to look at a portrait of the bread. In John chapter 6, and starting in verse number 31, John 6, 31 says, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Stop right there. Manna fell down, so they said it's from heaven. Jesus said, That wasn't the bread from heaven. I'm the bread from heaven. And verse 33, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Does that ring a bell? We want that bread. Well, just the last couple of Sundays we saw the woman at the well hearing about the water that would be a well springing up into everlasting life. And she said, give me that kind of water. Give me that water. Same thing here. Give us that bread. 35, and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Verse 48, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus just says it. Point blank, he doesn't mince words. They ate bread that you said was from heaven, and I can't help notice, but they're not with us anymore. It didn't give them eternal life. They are dead. 50, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven, <clears throat> that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which, is, which I will give for the life of the world. And down in verse 58, this is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He says it again. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Look this way, please. The body has a remarkable way and a remarkable God-given ability to be able to assimilate all manner of foods, no matter the variety of a person's tastes, and uh, and a lot of a lot of people have a lot of different tastes. How many of you were picky eaters as kids? Any picky eaters? And then did you get over that over time? Did you broaden out? A lot of us have done that. Were any of you force-fed as a child? Certain things, yeah, uh, that can happen. So, um, no matter the variety of person's tastes. The body has this remarkable ability to assimilate whatever that you partake of and turn it into blood and bone and flesh. The body exists on many different things, but did you know the body will exist for a time on just one thing, one food? Uh, bread is called the staff of life because it's that one food that ha contains almost all the nutrition needed for the human body. If you could only have one thing, think prison, bread and water, you know, there's a reason why that one thing would be bread. Uh, and Jesus talked about the bread of life, and so we need to focus tonight as we come to the Lord's table on Jesus, the bread of life. Because we've got a lot of keto Christians these days, <laughs> low-carb Christians, if you will. We need more of the bread of life, and we need to understand it more. And so number one, if you have your bulletin from this morning, these notes are, we put the PM notes uh, in the bulletin this week rather than the morning notes. Number one, the bread of life is heavenly Bread. We just read a number of verses that talk about what it truly means to be the bread coming down from heaven. Maybe everyone here had bread today. 
If we took a survey, probably almost everyone had some bread today. And how many of you know how to bake bread? Let's see how many bakers baking bread, okay? Quite a few. Uh, we know about bread. Well, there are several obvious contrasts between heavenly bread and earthly bread, and it would do us good to consider the contrast and the difference between heavenly bread and earthly bread. You may think of some more, but let me cite a few for you. Number one, earthly bread is man-made. Heavenly bread is God-made. One's man-made, one is God-made. Number two, earthly bread must be eaten regularly and repeatedly. Heavenly bread is eaten only once. Three, earthly bread has many ingredients, many earthly ingredients. Heavenly bread has one ingredient, one heavenly ingredient to it. And number four, earthly bread, of course, baked in man's oven. Heavenly bread prepared in heaven. Well, the people in this text that we just read should have understood more about heavenly bread. And this is why Jesus corrected them. They had knowledge of their forefathers and Moses being fed on daily portions of manna from heaven. They call attention to this uh, as they did in verse 31. No doubt it had been repeated over and over again how their forefathers existed on that exclusive diet and how they probably tried to have bread every which way to Sunday, trying to have some kind of variety on the same thing, basically. Jesus fed those thousands on the hillside bread. Uh, and he did that back in verses 4 uh, through 9. If you back up just a little bit, uh, you'll see that. The Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. Verse 5, Jesus lifted up his eyes, saw a great company, and said, Philip, where, whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And you know the rest of the story there, how Jesus took just a little lad's lunch, a little happy meal, and supersized it. I mean, really, miraculously supersized it. Jesus fed the thousands there on that hillside. But the bread of life is the bread of heaven, because those people that he fed that day didn't even follow him the next day when he preached on commitment. They turned and followed him no more, many of them, it says. They just wanted to see him do one of his tricks. They were just hungry and said, feed us. And then the next day, it would have been the same thing. Feed us again. Feed us again. Well, they needed to learn how to get permanent sustenance. What's the old saying? You can give a man a fish, but if you teach a man to fish, you fed him for a lifetime, right? Instead of just for a day. They need to find the real, eternal, heavenly bread of heaven. Well, it's at this point in the story, they don't un understand, they don't get the analogy just yet. Just like the woman at the well early on uh, didn't understand the water that Jesus was talking about. So, um, let's think about the manna that came down from heaven. It just floated down, and it would be there in the morning, and they called it manna. Does anybody remember what manna literally means? It means, what is it? <laughs> it's probably what they said. And so then they started calling it that. So what is it? Each Tomorrow morning, what is it's here? That was the new name for this bread now. Uh, how did the bread of life come down from heaven? Well, think with me of what Luke the physician said. He said, uh, he recorded... How the angel said to Mary, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. That's coming down. The virgin birth basically assured that the bread of life, heavenly bread, was going to come down. And aren't you thankful tonight that when we couldn't go up, he came down. He's pictured by the manna coming down. We should take opportunities to talk about salvation with other people. And when you do that, ask people how they know that they're going to heaven. You're trying to get them to reveal how they know it. In other words, don't just ask the question, are you saved? Because they can just say the word yes, and you still don't know if they truly are saved, right? But if you ask them, how do you know? Or if Jesus asked you, 
why should I let you into heaven? Ask them that question. Then you're going to get the explanation of what they're basing their belief on. It was just this week I, I spoke to a man and asked him, you know, what would you say to Jesus? And he said, I've, I've been a good man. I've lived a good life. Does that pass muster? We can't be good enough. So we had to talk about that. We went further uh, with that one. Well, the answer that a person gives basically gives you their, their view of the bread of life. Now hang with me here and don't miss this part. The answer that they give you of how they know they're going to heaven will tell you whether they believe the bread of life is heavenly or earthly. Let me illustrate. Earthly bread says this. Be a good person and go to heaven. Earthly bread would say very logically as a human in a very earthly way, they would say, be baptized, join the church, do good works, be reformed, turn over a new leaf. That's earthly bread. Heavenly bread says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The bread of life is heavenly bread. Number two, the bread of life is Jesus. What a simple point. The bread of life is Jesus. Now, we just read all these verses. If you were to do what I did this week and count, there are over 50 personal pronouns in that greater passage in this chapter. Most of them emphasizing that Jesus is the bread of life. He said, I am the bread of life. There's a personal pronoun when he's saying, I am the one. Now think with me for a second. For Jesus to say, I am the bread of life, if it's not true, would be blasphemy, right? You've got to get a kick out of people who say, Jesus was a good man, but he's not God. Now think about that. Good men don't go around claiming to be God, right? That's not a good thing to say if it's not true. If you say, I'm God, and you're not, nobody is going to say you're a good person because you're a liar or you're a lunatic. Or what if it's true? Maybe you're Lord. He claimed to be God and proved it on the third day. He used these 50 personal pronouns in this chapter saying, I am, I am the bread of life. I am, I am the light of the world. I am, I am the good shepherd. I am, I am the door. And of course, you know our world today and especially America says, there's not just one way to heaven. Oprah said it this week. Jesus is not the only way to heaven. She said those words. Incredible. Incredible. Because Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the door. He said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. I am the true vine, he says later in the book of John, chapter 15. I am. The Greek language construction places all these I am's in an emphatic position. Now, without going into great depth of the Greek, you could easily translate what he's saying as, I am the bread of life, and I so am that no one else is. That's the emphatic Greek tense, is I am and I alone am. Only I am. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is not politically correct. <laughs> and yet it's biblically correct. May we always stand for what's biblically correct, even when we look unpopular for saying things that are politically incorrect. Jesus doesn't allow room for comparison. Look down in verse number 32 of our text. 32. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. He's basically saying, I'm greater than Moses. I'm greater than the prophets. And oh, that was politically incorrect even on that day. You're saying you're better than Moses? 
Well, that could only be true if you really are God. And so, on that day and every day since, to this day that we are living right now, comes the fact that the only way to heaven is believing. They didn't believe, and so they were not going to be saved. These are hard sayings, they called them. Hard sayings. Skip down to verse number 53. We did not look at these before. 53. Then, Je then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, that's Jesus, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. That is a hard saying. If you, if you aren't a believer, if you don't understand what he's saying, we have to eat your flesh, we have to drink your blood, or we have no eternal life. 54. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me... Let me say it again. So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Okay. Listen carefully and we'll be done here pretty quick. Those are hard sayings. We can all see how that's difficult to understand. What he means about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. But right now all across the room... Raise your hand if you understand it. <laughs> you know what it means to eat of his flesh. It's not a literal thing. It's not about transubstantiation, as some would say. <clears throat> it's not about drinking literal blood. But we have partaken of the bread of life if we've been saved. We have drank of that blood if we have been saved. But they said these are hard sayings. Now, the thief on the cross is again a good example for us. Because Jesus himself looked at him and said, Today you will be with me in paradise. You believe and you are saved. And we've made the point before that he couldn't be baptized. That's one of the ordinances of the church. You don't do an ordinance in order to be saved. That proves it. You don't have to be baptized to be saved. Same thing about the Lord's Supper. He didn't partake. He couldn't partake of the Lord's Supper. And yet, he heard those words from the Christ himself. Today you will be with me in paradise. This is symbolism. What we do tonight is we partake of these elements that are before you. Eating and drinking are ways of expressing acceptance. When you eat and drink with someone, it's a way of accepting them or befriending them or showing acceptance. Um, <clears throat> that's what was so beautiful about Jesus eating with publicans and sinners was he saying, I love you. I accept you and I want something better for you. I want to save you as well. But I'm not just going to shun you. Because many in those days would say, I will not eat with people who eat with unwashed hands or somebody of another nationality or whatever. That was the opposite of acceptance. Eating and drinking are ways of expressing a full acceptance. And so as you partake of the elements tonight, you're picturing how you accept that the body of Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ are the means of salvation. Not us literally partaking of the elements being the means, but figuratively, symbolically, that his body had to be broken, that his blood had to be shed, that there was a price for sin, and that that body and that blood paid that price of death for us. Now, go ahead and take a look at the elements in front of you. Do you see them in the little cup holders in front of you? This is new for me. This is new for all of you. I don't believe it's permanent for us at, by any means, but it's what we're doing tonight. One thing you'll notice in a few minutes when you open, and let's not, let's not mess with that just yet, but when you open, 
you'll notice that the bread is easily broken. And I thought this week as I, as I noticed that, that there's a beautiful picture in that of how my Savior's body was broken for me. And, um, and I confess, I taste tested, okay? And I said, this is, this is a little bit bitter. This isn't like tasty. I've had unleavened bread the way we usually have it that tastes a little better, though it's not leavened, it's not risen, it's not as good as, as the Panera and that sort of thing that we enjoy from the bread ministry. And, and, and it, that stands out to me as yet another illustration of what a bitter cup our Lord took for us. And this isn't about how it tastes. This is about partaking and, and, and sensing the fellowship of his sufferings. How his body was broken for us. How his blood was poured out for us. I looked at it from a spiritual point of view. Then I looked at it from a business point of view as a pastor looking at our nice coverings on our pews and said, I hope we don't spill some of this as we try to open these on these nice pews. And that was a very human thought. And I still have that thought. Let's be careful. But you know, even if that happens, we've got another picture here of how the blood was spilt. Do we not? I mean, if worse comes to worse, it's another beautiful picture. No wonder at the Last Supper, uh, Jesus told them, from here on, when you come together, you're going to be remembering my body and my blood, however you partake of it. Some people use leavened bread rather than unleavened. I think that ruins the picture of the sinlessness of Christ. And yet, however you take it, if you're picturing the body, then that's the the important thing, is his body. Some people like us, have the unfermented juice because uh, that, again, is the right picture, I believe. But some people do the, uh, the fruit of the vine that is aged and, and is fermented. Uh, I personally am against that. Uh, that's not how we practice it tonight or ever as a church. Uh, and yet what is truly being pictured is what our focus needs to be on. This means that you and I can have communion tomorrow because we don't have to have those elements because we've had the real thing what we do tonight we do in remembrance of him these things symbolically figuratively picturing them so eating and drinking ways of expressing full acceptance now I have a missionary friend in Liberia that's in West Africa He's showed me pictures. He's told me, he's asked me to come preach there. I've not made it there yet. He's told me of hungry people. He's shown me starving children. Getting just enough in their families from very meager wages or sometimes government rations to just barely keep alive. And he said, Jerry, these people are living, but that's not living. They're existing, you know? And he says... A lot of them, though they're starving, literally, don't look as skinny as you think they would because their bellies start to bloat. And he said, you know, Jerry, it's a picture because they're empty bellies inside. It's deceiving how empty that they are. You know, today, many people without Christ look full and happy because they put on the plastic face, right? The fake smile, you ask them how they're doing, and, and great, right? But what's behind it all? Perhaps one of the best solos I ever heard in my life was the song, People Need the Lord, You Know the Song, sung by a missionary who came to my church as a kid in New Mexico, and he couldn't sing a lick. He had a terrible voice. Okay? And in his eyes was the truth of the words in a way so real that I long to hear him sing it again. And now I have a degree in music and I'd be repulsed by the way it sounds, but I so wish that I could hear him again 
sing, every day they pass me by. I can see it in their eye. Empty people, filled with care, headed who knows where. On they go through private pain, living fear to fear. Laughter hides their silent cries. Only Jesus hears. Do you know the chorus? Sing it. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, He's the open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize people need the Lord? I thought back on that years later as I had voice lessons and learned music theory and all of these things and said, Lord, help me never to be a performer that's just about impressing someone with, oh, I like your voice, but it'd be an empty shell. You know what I'm talking about? That person doesn't mean what they're saying, or they're not doing it for the Lord and His glory. They're doing it to lift themselves up. Even if you've got a terrible voice, you know what you can do? Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. (laughs) How many of you, when you sing... It's more like noise than music. Across the room, a few of you feel like it's noise. If it's a joyful noise, that's the real thing. Empty, bloated bellies may look like they're full. It's deceiving. That's the point. The bread of life is heavenly bread. The bread of life is Jesus himself. And the bread of life is eternal. This point and we are done. The bread of life is eternal bread. Manna they had to partake of every day. The bread of life, one time, eternal. Sometimes people criticize us. I have people say to me, oh, you're Baptist, you're one of those that believes once saved, always saved. How many of you have heard that criticism before? Oh, you all believe once saved, always saved. You know what you should fire back? What I say. No, I believe in eternal life. God gives eternal life. Not 10-day life, not 10-year life, not unless you sin a really bad sin life, but eternal life. And if eternal life ever ceases, then it wasn't eternal, was it? Eternal life. We talk about eternal security. That's the term that we use. I like just saying I believe in everlasting life. And if everlasting life ever ceases, then it didn't last ever, did it? It wasn't everlasting. Please note some other verses here in this sixth chapter. Look at verse 39. And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, that's those that believe, that's those that are saved, of all which he hath given me, I should, what are the next two words? Lose nothing. (laughs) Lose nothing. We're in the Father's hand. And there's no getting out of there. In verse 40, he continues on. This is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. It lasts forever. So, the bread from heaven is eternal bread. Earthly bread molds and decays. Heavenly bread, not so much. Not at all. The manna that they would gather, earthly bread, would stink and would attract worms. Gross. Verse 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. I want you to know that that same Greek tense is used there again, the emphatic tense. It could read, literally, shall not ever hunger, shall not ever thirst. Why? Ever? Because it's eternal bread. That's exactly why. 
It's true bread. Verse 32, look for the phrase true bread. Look at verse 33, you'll see bread of God. Down at verse 35, bread of life. Scan down to verse 41, bread from heaven. 51, living bread. We've got a whole other message to consider as the Lord allows us in the future on the blood, a portrait of the blood. And I look forward to sharing that. And we'll say a few words, of course, about the blood tonight. But we start here with the bread, the heavenly bread, Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Are you hungry for the bread of life? The poet expressed it this way about Jesus. He said this, I've tried in vain a thousand ways my fears to quell, my hopes to raise. But all I need, my Bible says, is Jesus. My soul is night, my heart is steel. I cannot see, I cannot feel. For life, for light, I must appeal to Jesus. He died, he lives, he reigns, he pleads. There's life in all his words and deeds. All, all a guilty sinner needs is Jesus. And though some will mock, though some will blame, in spite of fear, in spite of shame, I'll go to him because his name, say it with me, is Jesus. Health to the soul, harmony to the ear, honey to the taste, Jesus. And so... If you would take the elements in front of you, you'll see that you can open a little tab and peel away the lid, and then the lid has the wafer inside. You might want to just place the cup. As soon as you've got the lid off, place the cup down in the receptacle. We'll come to the cup in a few moments. And you might break the wafer as it comes to open, and that's okay. Jesus' body broken for us. Jesus said to his disciples, this do in remembrance of me. And so in a moment when we partake of the bread, we're going to pray. And we're going to close our eyes like we did this morning. We're going to take our eyes off of this world. We're going to... Consider the body of Jesus. In your mind's eye, you can do what I do. You can picture that body being whipped and beaten. You can picture the facial hair being literally ripped from the Savior. You can picture what they did to his body with the cat of nine tails. 39 stripes. You can picture how they beat him with rods. You can picture how they smote him and and mocked him and said, who was it that hit you if you're really God? You can picture a crown of thorns such as we have hanging in our baptistry above that cross You can picture that being platted deep into the scalp of he who is the Lamb of God. And we can consider that by believing on him, we eat his flesh. We partake of the body of the one who gave his body in exchange for ours. His body which endured hell for us so our bodies would not have to be cast into hell. He was consumed by sin, just as our bodies would be consumed by fire in hell. He took our hell for us. Just think of the body of Christ. Let's close our eyes and and ponder it for a few moments.
Brother Ed Hamilton, would you give thanks for the bread? Jesus said this do in remembrance of me, and so in remembrance of him. And now before we pick up the cup, I want to direct your attention to Isaiah 55. A passage I love to look at when we come to the blood. Isaiah 55. I'll give you a moment to get there and see this with your own eyes. The blood of Jesus is what paid the price. The blood of Jesus, which flows freely to us, but is certainly not cheap. It's the most valuable commodity that's ever existed. The blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us from all sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, Leviticus 17.11 says. Only by the blood of lambs could Old Testament people have their sins temporarily forgiven. And then the capital L, Lamb of God, came once and for all and shed His precious blood for us. And I love Isaiah 55, 1, which says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye by and eat. Yea, come by wine and milk without money, without price, and yet it's so valuable and free to us, spilled out for us. Let's close our eyes for a moment and see our Jesus on the cross. His body has already been broken at that point. But there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And there we are beneath, sinners, plunged beneath that flood, losing all our guilty stains. Though our sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Only with Jesus' blood is it possible that something red could wash white as snow. I like to imagine it being poured out there and being at the foot of the cross on my knees, looking up as I stand and seeing the blood spattered upon me. 
in realizing he did it for love. And now, Brother Terry Graneman, would you ask God's blessing on the cup? Jesus said, as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do remember my death till I come. And we talked about his coming this morning. And so he says, this do in remembrance of me, in remembrance of him. He said, till I come, until he comes. When Jesus had that last supper with his disciples, that first Lord's Supper, it said when they sung a hymn, they went out. And so we're going to sing. If you have your offering tonight and want to place it on your way out, you can do that. But after we're done singing, let's just go out in silence. Let's have our fellowship in the, in the lobby, in the fellowship hall, out in the yard as needed. But let's just, let's just leave this room in silence uh, this day, just as the disciples left that upper room. Let's sing. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Stand up. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free we love you god bless